to use the existing hardware, you have to get more resources and kind of tricky with the users to think that it's got more resources than it already has. Ah, cool. So um, I was asking about what virtualization is, um, and uh, the response was basically, um, I, I'm paraphrasing, saying you're creating an illusion to some extent, right? So that you're you're giving the um, user the impression that there's uh, you know hardware systems or probably even additional resources that they are not really there by creating them in in software, basically, right? So converting them into software, providing to the user. That's right. So fundamentally, those are the key principles. Even though we don't see all of those generally, we mostly, I think when we think about virtualization, what do we conventionally think, think about? Or well, what do you guys think about when you think here about virtualization? Virtualbox, right? So that's, that's one of the classics, right? So it's always about this uh, enc encapsulation with um, um, uh, the, 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 the kind of um, framing of processing power. And um, also when you talk about, you mentioned virtualization before, giving the impression, the illusion, it means also replicating the entire processor infrastructure so that any operating system can in principle be installed that supports the x86 instruction set and so on right so it's really about a lot of baggage that comes along with this kind of rebuilding a computer in the computer it sounds a bit of a like a recursion did anyone try to run a virtual machine in the virtual machine perhaps within a virtual machine as well i don't know i don't know if you have just share your experience because uh, it, it, it would be an interesting one but if you haven't done that yet find a spare machine and try it it's actually quite fun um anywho so so much about which oh, well not so much about virtualization but let's let's dig a bit deeper into virtualization and what it's um you know what what are the aspects that are commonly um, associated with this in addition to the um uh, general principle of fundamentally abstraction that's the main point you learn about abstraction everywhere at all times that's how you build maintainable systems in the first place i mean otherwise you would be uh, writing our programs all in C, of course, because that's likely the fastest practical well, assembly. Sorry, how could I uh, to, to write really efficient programs, right? So, but I think the maintainability is a bit of a challenge here if you think about it. And uh, since we're living in the real world, we kind of need to sometimes make concessions to this. So and that's the same here. Uh, abstraction is, is the key point. And this figure kind of brings it out quite nicely. When you think about uh, virtualization, uh, or let's say think about not virtualization in the first place on the left side, uh, we think about a um, you know um, a physical machine exactly. So as you said, a physical machine, the kind of a host machine, if you like, that has all the hardware that we need, right? So um, we always think about <clears throat> this in terms of um, processing, memory storage, and um, the the uh, and networking aspects, and um, of course peripherals and all that kind of stuff. So on top of it, we have the operating system. The operating system coordinates and uses those directly, right? Usually via drivers. In Linux, we have about 66 or two thirds of the Linux code is actually what for drivers, only drivers, um, to support all different hardwares you have, you'd find, right? You will know that uh, Linux is a monolithic kernel, so the idea is that everything is self contained. Also means that it's quite generic and uh, uh, supports a lot of drivers uh, and hardware out of the box because that's the role of the operating systems, linking the software side with the hardware side directly. So, okay, so, so far so good. What's virtualization? Um, well, the idea is. Uh, that the operating system directly operates on a on physical hardware if we have a um, concept of virtualization we suddenly allow our system to possibly run multiple vms right so arbitrary number of vms um and uh, the the only uh, challenges there how do we how do you afford this linkage between the actual hardware and the kind of virtualized hardware those virtual machines right and uh, conventionally there, there is a new kind of layer that is um, um, put in between that's um, considered here's reference as the virtual machine monitor um, you may have also heard about the concept of a hypervisor i'm not sure if you heard that anywhere before but this is the basically what this signals and the idea is that it is offers a layer of coordination uh, based on which hardware is virtualized right so you have all the physical resources all the hardware and this one is basically the only role there it's not so much being an operating system in our in our in the sense that uh, that that we can we can we use it that we actually can actively you know perform tasks in it and install software and so on but rather that it's just an in interface or a layer uh, based on which vms can be configured and instantiated right so um but fundamentally it's, it's beneath the hardware and uh, the vms we we call this form of virtualization in this extreme form um where we basically don't have an operating system per se 
um, on on the host system a um, a, a bare metal um, um, kind of virtualization. So the idea is really that uh, DVMs have a minimal level of abstraction between the hardware um, and you know their, their virtual environment basically. But um, that, yeah, so but without having any additional burden of a host operating system, right? So and the, the hypervisors literally they're basically a, a middleman that kind of interacts um, between hardware and, and, and software. Of course, it allows the, um, the communication amongst machines as well. So it can also virtualize. Of course, network infrastructure needs to be um, kind of realized. So in many instances, that actually happen within the hypervisor. So it's not really using the physical hardware to connect. You know wire network from one instance to the other one but actually even or particular this activity is virtualized this is a bit a big um performance increase in the first place right because as you know a communication bottleneck is often network in the first place due to its um a reasonably slow um response to care compared to all the all the other components that a um machine typically has yeah so this would be basically the basic idea of virtualization that we're basically uh, separating the physical hardware from the VMs that actually um, you know build on those and kind of basically are allocated parts of the relevant host hardware where where necessary we talk about this a bit more in a in a um, uh, in a bit but um, before going deeper in this okay now we talked about what virtualization is to some extent more generally and then a more concrete, let's say, in a compu uh, computational context, of course, virtualization is a very, very broad theme by its own, on its own. But um, now looking at it, so why do we do this virtualization business? Apparently, I mean, that seems to be, and then my earlier comment was in the same direction, uh, that doesn't necessarily call for efficiency in any way, right? If you suddenly have multi machines running on one machine, or in worse case, having more abstraction layers be between things, um, or software components that are running. So why do we do virtualization in the first place? Isolation. Sorry? Isolation. isolation, yeah. So more specific, what, what isolation do we have? So you, you're thinking about the VMs as isolation, right? So you're isolating one from the other, right? Yeah. Counter argument. Why don't you just have two machines? They are also probably more isolated than two VMs. So, yeah, I would say this was why it's way easier to actually do a VM than by computer. If I now want to test the operating system of the Galaxy operating system, I just combine the one of the specialized means with Linux. Okay, you're pointing to another aspect, which is kind of um, uh, maintainability in one one way or another, right? Like spinning up instances, you know, uh, taking them down and making them more flexibly available. So that's the point there. They're very, that's a, one of the central points. Yeah, so uh, that's going in the same direction, roughly, right? So that we, uh, one, one of the key purposes is really isolation of the application one from application two to some extent. Or are you talking within a VM? That's a special case. Uh, no across right yeah so that's that's the main main use case so we want to isolate functionality um, while at the same time have greater flexibility right so why 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 do in how far does flexibility come into play i mean uh, you know if you mentioned the the tear down and set up right spinning up machines and, and bringing them down based on demands quite flexibly and so on um but why is this conventionally um um why is this done? Um, of what are the other reasons we, uh, why we do it? It's not just, for example, most of the companies that uh, um, um, operate in the area of information systems, they don't constantly spin up virtual machines or you know, uh, bring them down and so on. They just leave them running. But nevertheless, they use it. So isolation is a very important point. But what other points are there? Any economic reasons? I mean, the oh. thing that I'm thinking of is that when you have like a cloud company providing service, yeah. then you basically can have, you have, you can just have one big machine or a few big machines, and then you can just press it up out of trades instances, in, in, instances by the user needs, right? Yeah. If I'm going out to a, to a, a cloud server yeah. company, I can choose what kind of hardware you have and like what kind of performance I can get without them needing to buy this specific, uh, specific uh, yeah. uh, 
So an ex extended response um, was that basically the really the you know, flexibility and scalability, I guess, or customizability. That's probably the response um, of, of 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 your your services that you need if, if you buy them from a cloud provider, because you can say, hey, I want this amount of resources, and they will just provide it in in a very flexible manner, and probably you know in about a, about the right uh, composition of resources that I want, not too many, not too little, right? So. Because if you buy um, a, a new machine, of course, it leads um, to, to massive, uh, massive um, uh, immediate costs that you, of course, need to think about uh, amortization. Um, and especially if you, again, running something lean like a startup, then you probably don't have this, this, this um, upfront funding uh, for those kind of uh, infrastructure projects. So you can, of, you can use this to flexibly scale up and down and grow with demand. So that's a very typical use case for a company that actually does software development or provision, though, right? So uh, but not necessarily the, the average industrial um, um, you know, um, player that plays, for example, in sector two, somewhere production area or something. They usually don't have necessarily have the scalability, those scalability requirements, but nevertheless will perform virtualization. So please. Uh, I was thinking about accessibility. So if you oh, want cool. to access a machine with a lot of resources, for, in, uh, for instance, in uh, computer vision, you need a specific machine with a specific hardware. Yeah. You can access it without being at that specific program. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, um, question, couldn't I just install, let's say, um, so the, the response is basically, it about makes, uh, assures accessibility, meaning that you have access to machines irrespective of location and their speciality uh, or specialization. So there was a reference to computer vision. You probably guys need to do something deep learning on, I don't know, on, on, on GPUs or something probably in a, a, in a dedicated environment that's, um, um, you know, that's not in, for, it, every day is available. And the point was there that it would make, you know, like easier, easy to be remote access. But wouldn't it be as easy to just install TeamView and then remotely access it? I mean, you know, do we really need the virtualization aspect to it? Or wouldn't it be just enough to have a machine and just, uh, you know, use remote um, remote control software in a wider sense? Can you remote control it without virtualization? Ah, okay, good. So the element here is, can we remote control without virtualization? Um, um, in, interesting. Uh, so fundamentally, the, 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 the idea of, of um, um, uh, remote control is not really intimately linked to the virtualization concept, but because it could just mean that the keyboard and uh, visual feedback is just forwarded, but no actual processing or virtualization per se happens on the client side, even though it looks like it, right? So, but it's basically just forwarding the, the, the information. But if you think about you're helping out, you know, someone using TeamViewer, then you wouldn't have the impression that their machine is suddenly running on yours as opposed to you having access to uh, their, their um, uh, resources more or less directly. But fundamentally, it's a very interesting point you're making. You can basically replicate rare or specific environments, right? Very specific environments that you would need for, I don't know, for class exercise or whatever else. The lecture could just as a button press provide you this precise environment, right? So every time um, we, um, and we're doing the same here to some extent uh, that I'm suggesting, you know, please run Ubuntu 2020, right? So I'm saying use that environment because that's something we, you know, have tested and we kind of know what's happening, what's not happening. But if you use a different Linux, then, you know, it's slightly more, more challenging than there, uh, you know, in terms of support and possible errors that can occur unless you are you know i'm able to mention it yourself so this is an uh, interesting example where you can customize based on virtualization as well and if you wanted very specific environment so if you insisted that we wanted to install golang on it already you know 115.6 which other version would you run ever anyway but um so th then we could uh, offer this so visualizations could be quite helpful there so that would be a customizability aspect and at the same time scalability right so because it doesn't matter if we have one student 70 or 700 right well it does but not to me but rather to the guys running the uh open stack cluster downstairs right so but even then i don't think they would be challenged so, um yes so we have this flexibility um so can you think there, there are some more reasons i could come or could, could reflect on they are interlinked of course this <laughs> Uh, as many of those topics, um, um, they're kind of not really isolated. What are other reasons possibly that would make for you in a company, because you will likely be in that position in the future to make perhaps uh, decisions about, you know, investments and in, uh, infrastructure allocations and so on. What would make you consider virtualization or not? Please. It's easier to maintain one new machine with several uh, operating systems running than having eight machines which you have to manage your configuration. Yep, 
So that's a very important point. You, you avoid this whole duplication of infrastructure in a way, right? So instead of, you know, if you're running, uh, and, and then often, um, so the idea is basically that you use only one machine, or ideally you need to only make maintain one or few machines in any case, running those services that you need, as opposed to uh, having a one-to-one -one allocation of service and machine, therefore needing to run, let's say, you know, eight machines if you have eight services, or worse, 80 machines if you have 80 services, right? And so perhaps the other aspect, are all the services usually under equal level of load? In a, yeah, hard to ever, yeah, hardly ever, right? So, I mean, there's uh, usually a kind of significant drop off in service usage, usage because you will have a lot of those, um, like exotic services that are someone used, for example, by, I don't know, by HR, but only every year or by accounting or whatever else, right? But then other services that are relevant for the daily production or logistics management or, or whatever else. So, so the idea is also, again, that you, what can you leverage from there? And it goes back to your earlier point. But, um, so if you have an unequal dis is a distribution of resource usage, what is the benefit of virtualization then? You can you can flexibly allocate the resource use right so if you had f a let's say one single machine or a few uh, single single machines basically handling all those services it would be very flexible to ensure that the load on that machine is reasonably high therefore it's you know uh, it's efficiently used not just idling if you have eight machines idling you're paying basically just for the uh, you know, the, the, yeah, the, the idle processor time running and actually the, the heat it produces to some extent. But if there's actually something happening for it, right? So you're running eight services for a machine that is under decent load, let's say, I don't know, 50% or whatever, or higher than that to accommodate certain peaks or bursts, um, then you actually have a much more um, uh, efficient use of the infrastructure, right? Idling machines are not an efficient use of the infrastructure. You want to bring resource allocation up. And then if you have uh, variable levels of resource needs or resource use, it's better to run this on one machine because it, probabilistically, in any case, the balance sheets are out, right? So if you have one service that is, uh, uses um, extensive CPU resources, for example, another one less so, and that changes over time, then you get this um, um, flexibility effect that you observe from... Um, um, uh, you, have, you have this flexibility that you observe from the uh, um, cloud infrastructure more generally I argued about this point that the flexible scaling up and down is one of the key features to um, make things flexible from a deployment point of view, but also service development. So there's a set of reasons um, and there is always in life, they're not always only technological in kind, right? So uh, in most sense, and they're interlinked. I mean, there's no hard and cut, hard and sharp boundary between those ones. So I'm you need to be careful, carefully treading here, but I just want to argue it, that oftentimes we do things not just for the for technological reasons. So along the lines, because we can, cool, we can run eight machines in one machine. How cool is that? Or we can run eight machines in, you know, or we can, I don't know, have a, um, uh, you know, a run virtual machine, a virtual machine within a virtual machine or whatever, just because we can it. There needs to be value and a reason for actually doing it. What we do here is, of course, testing technology and see how we can use it. But in real life, you need to be pragmatic and say, think about, okay, what's the use case and why do I actually want to do it, right? So that's, uh, that's the main point here. So economically, it's really uh, one of the aspects um, from an accounting point of view, quite pragmatically, you buy less machines. But even if you're host in-house, but not in mouth sourcing. So when I talk about virtualization, I'm indifferent about as to whether you host with AWS or in-house for now, right? So it's just about the tech, not so much about the uh, decision where it's, things are actually running. But it's in any case more efficient. It's just easier to have or cheaper to have fewer machines idling or not idling or ideally being under load than having very few uh, machines that are mostly idling and only responding to bursts, right? So um, <clears throat> the uh, other aspect is that um, the, 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 the um, from an economic point of view, virtualization, of course, offers a significant advantage with respect to robustness, right? So uh, we talked, I mean, if you recall my brief talk about Google Cloud Computing, that instance, um, it was very simple. Um, and yeah, so it was very simple in principle to implement the idea of load balancing. So we basically have multiple services that are hidden behind some sort of network infrastructure and the user doesn't really know which server that is right um, they're actually using when they call make a request to a particular service and that shouldn't matter right and uh, of course you can do this physically in hardware as well but it's a lot cheaper and easier to do this in software in the first place right so and by having this flexible allocation it's also easier for you to take down one of the vms update it modify it play with this whatever else 
bring it back up again and suddenly it's available again for use as well right so um the other aspect or key feature that vms um, um uh, bring about this is again technology but also economic because again it always boils down to downtime if you keep your system available that could be you know valuable minutes and you know therefore valuable krona in terms of your income Mount downtime is your enemy uh, economically speaking from a business perspective but um this this flexibility really can pay off there as well right so um one of the other features is the ability to take for example snapshots or make images of running machines right so you say okay take a snapshot now both for you know reliability reasons but also that you can take it you know, offline modified or uh, perform modifications before putting it back into a live system, right? So pretty much a bit like versioning, of course, in, in, in the concept of um, software development as we know it. So that's a lot harder with physical environments, right? So, I mean, I understand Mac, for example, has Time Machine as a means of performing backups and rolling back. But basically, you know, doing backup and rollback, your system's occupied, right? You can do anything else before the system becomes productive again. In the VM case, that's left to the kind of uh, VM environment you take a snapshot, but the VM in principle continues its operation uh, in, 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 in the meantime. So just as one, one of the examples of the flexibility that you get, in addition to scaling, that meaning spinning up and spinning down machines in the first place. Um, the other aspect, um, from, a, from a technological and also economic point of view, of course, uh, it's, it's kind of the important aspect, the, under, the abstract from hardware. Uh, one of the pain points um, that um, you would experience in companies prior to the extensive adoption of virtualization in the mid 2000s um, was that there was always this debate about when to switch hardware um, because naturally we have kind of a stack right we have hardware operating system software running on it and they need to migrate data right so all a bit of painful kind of interaction so if you have ever engaged in a form of data, data migration between different erp systems or you know um, uh, larger services like um, uh, enterprise level services this is really uh, an, an, an interesting exercise and there's a lot of money to be made there. So, but what's, what's the point that I might want to make here is, well, generally we experience both from a technological but also an accounting point of view that hardware has a very limited time span. Um, you know, so from an accounting point of view, um, we uh, um, should be calculating with a, you know, three year uh, amortization, uh, at least from a, from, a, from a balance sheet point of view, right? So it should be paid off the hardware effectively. Um, but in many instances, people just extend the lifetime, which is running and further because it's, it's written off, but it's still running. So good luck. Let's, let's go for it. And they wait <clears throat> until there's a significant uh, uh, disruption in one way or another, or it becomes simply inefficient to run it. For example, inefficient um, or, uh, op, uh, extensive power consumption or the um, performance uh, point is just not up to speed anymore. So, okay. So hardware is probably the shortest lived one. And then the idea is then on top of hardware, of course, lifts some sort of software. And that's where things are, where people become more hesitant. People are in principle not hesitant in changing the hardware. I don't care about the particular machines as long as it provides me the power I need. What I care more about is like the operating system that runs on it. For example, if my software, my custom software only runs on that operating system, right? There's a reason why many uh, corporations still, you know, thrive on and uh, rely on Windows 7, even though they shouldn't, right? For obvious reasons, as a private person would ask yourself, why on hell would you still run Windows 7? It's just inherently un, uh, irresponsible on any level. But many companies simply have software that has not been tested or doesn't run or has issues on Windows 10 or whatever else. So they just continue running the system. Why not in the first place? Because they don't lose money. Well, until they have a security breach, of course. But that's a different story. So, but, uh, so th th there's oftentimes this, this sluggish motivation. And that is, of course, slightly worse for custom software that has been written for you or by you yourself, right? And this lifetime of the software is generally expected to be ex exceed the hardware in the first place. So that's, there's that aspect to it. And then, of course, there's the lifetime of the data. The data, data is even longer living. Often uh, there's a, um, uh, from, from an information management point of view, you put like a label of 30 years on data. Uh, so that may be less for compliance reasons, like 10 years for tax or accounting reasons. But you need to think about the production data, right? If you're a production company that actually, uh, you know, um, um, produces something, there you go. I don't know, best furniture, you name it and so on. There's a lot of information that is actually provided over the years that uh, should be accumulated and kept, of course. That's to some extent increasingly realized as the value of the company as well, the assets. Uh, so uh, data is really, really important. So ideally it would be kept for a company lifetime in as far as relevant for the core business of the company. So <clears throat> the point I wanna make is here, abstracting from the aligning hardware can make sense if you're very flexible and changing out the hardware without affecting anything else, right? 
uh, in the virtual machine, for example, you still run your environment um, by, for example, shifting to a cloud service or in, indeed uh, just bringing up the VM on another uh, hypervisor or whatever else, right? It really provides you the flexibility and also the dissociation between those different levels because they are just not the same thing. It's not like you, you just buy a new machine, install everything, and everything works in two hours. That's you know, oftentimes not the case. The installation of the machine is cheaper, but the software often and configuration, integration, and so on, that's where things become a bit more. Uh, changing. Of course, there are ways of alleviating this. If anyone has taken, of you has taken um, the um, software configuration management course uh, from EEC somewhere, operations, um, they talk about how to automate some of those aspects, right? Even irrespective of operating systems. But nevertheless, it's still a pain, painful exercise to to um, to manage this. So this is an important point. So if your hardware fails, your short software fails. The for, short, sorry, the software shouldn't, and that's the main point there. Um, you have, then you have the flexibility. The other aspect from a technological reasons, you mentioned it all basically is kind of the reliability to some extent uh, sponsored by the isolation of the services that are nevertheless running on the same physical hardware. That's the kind of cool bit about it, right? Having the distinctive and separate machines, of course, even more isolated, right? No questions there, right? Because they, they have a physical separation on top of it. But um, it's, 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 a, it's a, a good compromise in terms of isolation in the first place and therefore associated with the idea of having a bit more having a reliability um, ex um, reliable execution by speeding up multiple instances bring it down changing snapshots versioning um, and so on all the features you get and um, implicitly then also well security again if someone breaches your host uh, your host system then you know, your vms are probably not the safest even you run even if you run eight of those right so we need to be very cautious here that whether this is actually a, a reasonable factor but um, that uh, could be uh, one aspect to be considered from a operations point of view. And the other aspect that uh, you, you, uh, we heard repeatedly about, it, especially if you're running IT or providing IT, is really the scalability aspect, right? So it's quite flexible of spinning up yet another instance on top of what you have already. So basically, just um, uh, some 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 the, the, the summary um, uh, points that are just made for for VM specifically here, so you can just reflect on if you wanted, but um, so we have multiple operating systems, the main point. Um, we dissociate particular host and VM. Um, that's the isolation bit, right? So if one of the servers come down, it doesn't bring out on the rest, hopefully. Um, and the um, security to some extent. Um, and other aspects, in, yeah, okay. So the downside, of course, are obvious as well, right? So we need to think about if you have eight VMs suddenly running a machine, they all get load for whatever reason, because they're kind of, you haven't planned property properly, and they all seem to be used, as, you know, seasonally in, in kind of you know inverse mode because they all happen to run different web shops and that are you know invoked during Christmas season. Yeah, guess what? Then your host machine uh, may have actually a challenge. So there's a bit of capacity planning needed in order to ensure that you know your max load of the services that you're actually running does not hit the boundaries of uh, um, physical resources available. So. Um, one aspect that is, of course, we can't ex ignore that any any form of abstraction, uh, especially at runtime, leads to uh, loss in efficiency. Right? There's no questions about it. Right? If we think about um, um, the, the this translation of every command, for example, um, a system call, if you wanted to, um, in some instances that can be completely absorbed in the VM, let's say a system call, but in some instances you actually need to address the physical hardware. Uh, immediately and uh, any system call will lead to a, um, need to go through the hypervisor or at least to the hypervisor thereby le leading to inefficiencies right but it's basically the same um, when you write software as well right apis are kind of there for a purpose and that's usually maintainability accessibility usability slash reusability of code but you may probably be in many instances more efficient directly exposing internals of you know, either models to each other and directly you know, invoke the functionality or even replicate functionality and so on. But um, that is not something we, we're looking at it uh, right now. That's something if you, next year, do you still have the course professional programming? Do you guys have this in um, data engineer? I'm not sure, the programmers, you are BPROC, right? You're my, okay. Do, do you know about professional programming in third year? Do you still have this course? Okay, so in any case, if you had it, um, there, um, at least this year it's run by uh, Per Mottenstrom. He's um, uh, really good. He's kind of an avid defender of the idea of data-oriented design. That means very hardware, uh, close to hardware, uh, 
a design of software, so optimized against hardware to some extent. And that's a different story. He, he will hate any idea of abstraction of that nature because he wants to be as efficient and as close to hardware uh, as possible. So there are different schools and different philosophies, and of course, different use cases, right? Not every software needs high level of abstraction or should have, and in other cases, it's highly desirable, right? So it really depends on the use case. So we need to be clear here about it. But abstraction uh, eats uh, performance. So it's the main, main point there. Um, that I just want to make. That's that's why my, my joke about virtual machines in virtual machines, because then you really feel it quite quickly. And of course, trickle down effects from the from the host side. So um, so that's basically the idea of uh, virtualization uh, along its ups, uh, upsides and downsides, uh, really. And they kind of translate quite well now if you realize it, uh, or that, that we have talked about, it, I guess, uh, in, in uh, to cloud technology, right? The flexible scaling, reliability, the replication in software, your ability to kind of um, remotely allocate on whatever hardware because you wouldn't know what you're allocating on if you're lucky you know where you're allocating what region let's say in aws or google cloud computing but that's about that right if you would you wouldn't be able to make any sort of distinctive um, uh, get it it's distinctive insight so this abstraction is basically kind of the same but then videoed it via network as well um so as of now, I just gave the illusion in any case that there's only one form of virtualization that is basically that you have a hypervisor, um, you know, this this control virtual machine monitor that's running directly on hardware and exposing um, the um, hardware resources kind of virtually to, you know, um, machines that run on top of it, right? So that's this old good old hypervisor model, um, the first form or, yeah, I guess the first practically relevant uh, form of uh, virtualization as, as it was used, it avoids the abstraction of um, by, by avoiding a host of dedicated host operating system on hardware. It's literally just this piece of software hypervisor is installed from there and only VMs, nothing else, right? So that's the idea. And then within the VMs, you have all the complexity again. You need to install an operating system. You need to install the libraries and the applications. That's exactly what you experienced in um, OpenStack, right? So you have a full Ubuntu in there with all the pain points that come with it. You need to do network configuration, of course. You guys need to run the updates, of course. You think about your own deployments, of course, and, and you know see if configurations don't work out. You need to fiddle until it works, right? In Heroku, that was largely done for you. You just say, hey, here's my Git repo, uh, you know, um, um, and uh, Heroku push uh, basically makes it happen and basically compiles it, does everything on the server side, and let's hope the guys do their job and actually think about software updates themselves, so they actually keep the system. Uh, up to speed and uh, update and so on, but that's out of your hands, right? But here it's really all managed, basically, uh, in, in all, needs to be managed on the virtual machine level. So in addition to this type one, uh, one virtualization, with the increasing availability of, um, you know, again, it's usual the narrative, the computational resources, right? Uh, machines being more efficient, but also uh, offering um, virtualization features out of the box. So the hardware, the underlying hardware, already is prepared to offer virtualization features that were usually emulated in software themselves uh, in, in the hypervisor itself. Um, the, the idea was there, okay, can we just not only think about being machines being dedicated to the use of virtual machines, like, uh, you know, a machine that just serves the, server, uh, the purpose of kind of running um, uh, VMs, but also kind of use it alongside conventional software on operating systems. And that's the point you guys made earlier, because when you think about um, virtualization initially, you likely thought about something like VirtualBox, right? Or um, uh, VMware. Does anyone does that still think? You guys remember? That? Yeah. So that's that's was. I'm not sure if it's still there, but it was in any case the virtualization software um, um, for for a long time. I see. Yeah. So it's still quite heavy. The, the, the challenge is there. Basically, it's there's a price point to it uh, for the enterprise version. In any case, and I think this has will you know will hamper the long-term adoption. Whereas, for example, VirtualBox is free, and uh, in as far as the operating system goes, you got free virtualization as well already. So um, in, uh, from Microsoft now, so there's a bit of natural competition, I guess. Um, but yeah, those were the big players. But the idea is that, okay, can we install something, you know, next to software on our host OS? That would be the form of what we refer to to type two virtualization. So type one, bare metal virtualization, where the machine only serves one purpose, and that is to run virtual machines, literally nothing else, plus some control interface and so on. The second one is basically type two, uh, a, that, that the virtual machine or the hypervisor is just a piece of software you install on your operating system, on your host yourself right 
So it's not directly interacting with the hardware, but in fact, it itself uses the host um, um, uh, API and interaction and system calls and so on to kind of translate functionality to hardware. Again, with uh, support by uh, you know extended instruction sets on processor side that allow more or less direct access to hardware for efficiency increase. But fundamentally, that's still baked in um, the support also into the um, operating system there as well. So type two virtualization. Classical examples again, as I mentioned, uh, VM workstation virtual box. Um, what's the Mac? Virtualization software again? Uh, parallels. That's right. Parallels, same thing, right? So it falls in the bracket, this bracket here as well, because you can just run in parallel to, well, that was nice, in parallel to um, any software you probably run on it anyway. So it doesn't really conflict um, on, yeah, satisfies this, this particular need on the Mac world. So every operating system kind of has its set of um, 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 software that um, can support either one. Um, and um, that supports the parallel execution um, of, of um, virtual machines uh, on a host operating system. Cool. All right, uh, I think we have 11.01, otherwise I'm in trouble again. Um, so let's say 11.15, we continue. And I'll look at the far right side, what's happening here. So we need to talk about this a bit more um, after that. So see you in, in about 15 minutes. I use you guys as a proxy since most students here have returned to their places or have in any case returned. Um, that's that's uh, sure work for now. Okay, so um, right in, in so leading to this point, I just briefly want we discussed a bit the idea of virtualization, how it's relevant um, and to us and what kind of underlying motivations are there, right? So. And uh, the main the main aspects were abstraction from the aligning hardware. So we have a bit of flexibility, dissociation. We have isolation, in particular, uh, from practical reasons, scalability, but also security reasons, for for example, uh, and uh, ideally robustness as well, right? So if you don't run anything on the core host and only in VMs, then it's you know uh, reasonably easy to to bring those down, tear those down, or uh, not have other services affected if one of those uh, ones doesn't do its job. So, so in, in addition to then, you know, having the progression from, um, let's say, the purest form of virtualization that operates directly, more or less directly on the hardware, only mediated by a virtual machine manager, like or hypervisor, or formally, uh, we moved almost towards like what we would consider the kind of desktop solutions to virtualization to some extent, um, which are, of course, a very relevant, um, very um, relevant point. But on the far right side, we see a, a, a further movement that kind of um, yeah pushes uh, the boundaries even further. And um, what's the significant difference that um, you know the, the form of let's say let's call it virtualization the um, form of virtualization that you see on the right side and the virtualization that you see in the middle, the type two virtualization. What are the significant differences? Please. I don't know. Yes. We don't have any guest operating system anymore, right? So that's the main main point. So one of the pain points of virtual machines, both in terms of yeah, space, not so much anymore, but historically, yes, it's like uh, you have this entire blob of operating system in there, right? So it's usually a significant code base needs to be individually updated and all that kind of jazz. So it, it kind of really makes it quite uh, painful to maintain. And um, the idea is there, okay, can we uh, remove this from the equation as well? So, you know, do we not, yeah, can we, can we, remove the operating system in the first place and basically just uh, allow the installation of libraries that sit and live on top of those um, operating systems um, um, but are relevant for the application the user applications and you know, services that may be installed and running um, entirely and that's the idea here so that uh, now uh, the with the uh, focus on what is referred to as application level virtualization um, the idea is basically to okay, okay let's let's not think about virtual machines as a whole anymore but only services or applications as a container in a wider sense or a virtual machine but point is it's not a virtual machine anymore because it doesn't have the operating system anymore like the whole virtualized hardware infrastructure so hence like um can we externalize all this activity and introduce a novel hypervisor or daemon or whatever else that sits between the operating system and additional libraries that are likely shared between you know all the services that we're using in the first place because in many instances people also realize yeah you know they kind of rely even on the same operating system so you know then it should be very easy and cheap to kind of externalize this operating system in the first place 
And then in those boxes here, you just would see, you know, additional libraries in as far as relevant for the particular um, application, of course, the application instance, ideally in binary form itself only being deployed. So that's the idea, uh, pulling this uh, a bit further. So you see this kind of natural progression from being very close to hardware, having the flexibility of the operating system, and then optimizing against the services, not so much against a generic virtual machine anymore, right? So, um, and this, this is not only lean, of course, but it also has certain other uh, features that I want to uh, talk about in a bit. So those are the, the, the kind of progressions that we see. So type one a virtualization, type two virtualization, and then what could be referenced as application level virtualization, often associated with Docker. Um, that's the principal idea um, there. So we get to that um, in a bit. Um, just to recall some of the solutions that operate on the type one and type two level um, uh, for your own mental reference is um, classical Zen, uh, we, uh, we, we MWare, so one of the big players, uh, ES, uh, ESX, that's directly uh, installed at Hypervisor and um, Hyper-V, so, yeah, I think um, it falls in bracket as well. And um, then the type two virtualization is the one you are dealing with more uh, realistically. It's like, you know, VirtualBox, VirtualPC, is that still a thing? I'm not sure if that's still part of Microsoft, but it was in any case of Windows, VMware Workstation. And then we have the container solutions. We come back to those ones, I just want to motivate this. Uh, we'll bring this to your attention. So if you want to um, kind of reflect on the different solutions, um, but we'll not spend much time, especially on classical bare, bare metal uh, virtualization, but rather you move towards containerization. So summing up, um, containerization, why do we do this? Well, you know, we still maintain a consistent and isolated environment, right? All those services living in those containers should be separated from each other. Um, the um, other aspect is, of course, that we are interested in being in very lean. So that's why we kick out the operating system, which would be generally larger than the services, right? We talk the distribution of um, uh, operating system in the VM and then the actual service. We talk about a factor at least one to 100, if not more, right? So which, let's say uh, if, if you are, um, uh, or, yeah, depending on how, whatever your service is, it really depends. But oftentimes service can be as small as being a few megabytes only because all, all the heavy lifting, for example, is offloaded to a database. You basically just run a daemon that is connected to, um, but the operating system is disproportionately large in this uh, context, right? And still assumes um, um, some gigabyte of space allocation in any case. So to make things fast, lean and efficient, uh, in containerization, we want to get rid of as much as possible of all of this to really focus more or less on the bare service in its fast uh, executing, right? Um, another aspect that is more related to the market adoption of containerization in the past few years, I'll get to that in a bit, is really the mobility. Um, any bigger player nowadays does not only support the idea of VMs, but also supports, you know, container, um, um, running containers directly, right? So um, what it means basically that they spin up again a VM for you, uh, have this, this this virtualization daemon, this containerization daemon running between, and you just, you know, um, basically run, uh, send, send your images, let's say container images, and they run them for you on top of it, right? So it feels a bit like a pass kind of environment, but it's not in the sense that it, within the containers, you can pretty much do anything you like in terms of programming language uh, and um, uh, even access, and we get to that, operating system functionality to some extent. So it's um, an interesting hybrid that kind of tries to take the best of both worlds, sometimes with challenges, but nevertheless. So, um, so mobility is a good, uh, important point of flexibility um, of, of um, containers and services. The automation is uh, a central aspect. So while um, the earlier forms of virtualization, especially ones you know, associated with a particular instance uh, and you know, particular hardware, uh, usually were built with the idea that they run and basically you know, instantiate and run for a longer period, extended periods, right? But um, with the idea of um, containerization, comes also the expectation that it should be very lean and easy to spin up and down different containers that run, uh, you know, yeah, uh, over time, of course, right? So to exchange instances to scale up, scale down, particularly the scaling up and down. If you imagine that you have an extended uh, or extensive uh, load or requests uh, on your web shop, whatever else, and you can just very easily spin up a different uh, additional containers without spinning up additional operating systems, you may imagine this efficiency increase and therefore uh, you know the the fast deployment or relatively fast deployment that 
uh, those containers solutions have to offer. But most importantly, it needs to be um, scriptable, right? So it's not just a matter of some system admin spinning up and down the instances doing network configuration, assigning whatever, I don't know, you know, resources and so on. But the idea is that this can be uh, automated to a significant large extent. So it plays a lot into um, the whole DevOps movement as well, so that you know um, the intersection between development and operations is becoming increasingly blurry by, for example, affording direct deployment and repeated deployment based on continuous integration of code that you wrote, uh, or even deployment for tests, uh, for automated tests in the first place and so on. Here the automation really comes into play um, in, 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 as part of your uh, development tool chain um, and the use of Docker for arbitrary purposes ranging from uh, QA testing uh, to actual deployment, of course, and then probably in variable forms being, you know, stable, experimental, and uh, whatever other um, 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 deployments you actually want to offer. And uh, I mentioned the basis for scaling. So the idea here, what I want to get there, at there is that containerization, or the main point about containerization here is to isolate on service level or application level uh, signal here or app or whatever you want, want to name it. So the idea is in one container, you're only running one service, not five, right? So you, you, could, you, you could do that here for us as well, but people will likely like, you know, combine uh, services, uh, you know, um, um, within given VMs where it seems useful. Ah, yeah, this service doesn't use too much resources. Let's put another one in there. So if you suddenly have two uh, software uh, instances um, running, um, in, in a particular VM, but in containers, the idea is really a clear one-to-one, -one, uh, to have a clear one-to-one -one relationship between the service that you're running and the container. And the idea is basically that you can then selectively scale up and down individual services, right? If you separate them in different containers, if you like, uh, and replicate those ones, then you can flexibly scale up and down without, for example, you know, duplicating the number of services, uh, uh, you know, if multiple services are actually running in one um, container, that's the main idea. So this, um, this is the last point here that I'm linking. Um, this um, built-in idea of having a, you know, orchestration and decom or composition rather of, 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 of services. So by having a very fine-grained model of virtualization. So that's really an essential uh, aspect um, to it. So this will be a topic that will, well, accompany you certainly um, for, for quite some time um, to come. So in terms of uh, how's the situation in the, um, application level virtualization space, there's always also um, a market dimension, right? Every time we look at technology, you should not only look at the tech itself, because a lot of good technology has never made it onto the market, not because, you know, there are problems other than, uh, you know, um, finding the right uh, means for, for, for kind of um, all the right application use cases, having too much competing technology that has, uh, you know, a bit more um, funding behind it and so on. So sometimes uh, there, there are non-technical reasons for non-adoption, of course. And uh, here, the point I want to make is that um, containerization here represented by Docker itself, uh, and then more abstractly, just, you know, by monitoring the deployments, basically, of, of Docker, um, kind of signals that there's a clear uptake um, from, from a um, information systems point of view. So, particularly, of course, in North America, closely followed from Europe and uh, Asia uh, Pacific are not far behind. Um, that is projected for 2024, but um, so it's not very super up to date, but it shows the clear, it's not actually a linear trend, I guess, um, of, of adoption of containerization in the industrial settings. So you will have limited chance of getting around it. On the other hand, what I increasingly realize is um, when talking about, um, or you know, what you increasingly see when you look at uh, GitHub as well, um, that most developers will opt for offering their software as a, you know, container as well on top of whatever form of deployment they choose, because it's just uh, standardizes and makes the deployment um, kind of so much easier. Even, even if you're only worried about one service at a time, right? So even if you don't think about this whole mobility composition business, but just say if you want to spin up one um, application, then uh, don't run in the host, run in Docker container. That's basically the idea. That's how lean the idea, um, the, the concept should be in the first place. So um, I kind of like this metaphor. Perhaps it makes it makes things more accessible for some. It's not necessarily a, a good if you're coming from a technical background. But the idea is like um, you know, if you want to compare containers and virtual machines, it's really about um, looking at houses with you know apartments to some extent, right? So where you basically 
have a shared infrastructure, being it you know um, wastewater management, freshwater management, power infrastructure, um, um, internet probably, and so on. So networking in particular. In, in a partner setting, you don't need to worry about it. You imagine yourself in a, a sit apartment, for example, right? So it's all kind of under a shared roof. Uh, but um, some of the resources are shared and some of them are not. There are, of course, certain limitations then as well, right? So if all uh, individuals in your household, of course, using uh, except making extensive use of the internet connectivity that may affect you in terms of performance but overall if it scales actually uh, you know to a significant extent then it should balance each other out because you wouldn't again uh, akin to the motivation for cloud services i mentioned earlier a few weeks back uh, you wouldn't expect anyone to have you know full use of resources at any time anyway um so and if you had you know in a virtual machine setting more akin to a house you really need to replicate the entire infrastructure right up to the um, um you know um, with respect to of course the, the building itself but also the internals the um, um power and, uh, and so on water supply and all those kind of different aspects so that's kind of the metaphor underlying it certain elements are shared others are not but in principle that's the main point uh, the shared infrastructure is accessible from within uh, the um, individual services. That's the main um, way of doing this. So how is this? How is this technically? How is this technically uh, resolved? Because uh, I mean, I, I was always talking about very fuzzily. On the one hand, having virtualization. On the other hand, saying, "Hey, hang on. There's access to you know operating systems features, but at the same time, containers don't have the operating systems in there. How does it work? Right? Doesn't it breach the principles of isolation that you already probably would expect in a way? Right? And um, Here's a particular point, and towards the last, uh, towards the end of the last session, uh, when I just motivated the use of um, virtualization in the first place, it was an important point made there, uh, how, how challenging it can be to um, run different containerization solutions on different operating systems. But I just want to play up uh, uh, the role that Linux in particular took um, in, in kind of motivating or providing a basis for diverse um, forms of um, application level of virtual, uh, application level virtualization. So that's the idea that uh, um, uh, Linux introduced the facility to group resource allocations. So not so much to say, hey, we have all those different resources, and uh, you see how much you want to use our CPU and how much memory and so on. But also, but but rather kind of you know allocate a set of resources um, dedicatedly to particular. Um, uh, in, in to organize them into groups, so-called control groups, C groups that you will commonly find. So if you um, type C groups in Google, you will uh, that will be the proper reference, but control groups is a formal concept. Um, and it basically ensures that there's an allocation of all relevant resources in as far, um, you know, as, as, as um, accessible for, from the operating system perspective, uh, um, you know, accessible also within um, containers. And um, the idea is basically that this linkage is done by having those different C groups, right? So you have a certain allocation on CPU, memory, network, and storage, the classical components that you would expect when we think about operating systems, um, and um, compose them in a way so that they virtualize more or less the resources within a container, but without giving direct access to the operating system or even the underlying hardware. So that's the main, um, main point. So what happens in practice there is that um, you have a um, operating set, um, sorry, an operating system level isolation of different um, resource allocations. So the C groups are isolated from each other. And that's a, that's a task that's done by the operating system, right? If a particular um, um, set of storage resources are allocated to one group, they shall not be uh, allocated to another one, um, for example. So to kind of ensure the isolation and uh, reliability. But again, the operating system is more closer, uh, closer to hardware. Therefore, doing any sort of isolation will be more efficient on the operating system as well. That's why bringing it down to that level is one of the motivations um, when um, introducing the concept into Linux more generally. And has since then been broadly adopted by a diverse set of virtualization solutions, Docker being one of them, um, but uh, uh, various um, other ones. And I think this is a really part of the reason why Docker adoption um, and um, or containerization on Linux is so particularly strong because the features are uh, supported out of you know out of the box that is out of the operating system itself, uh, the main kernel. So um, which makes it very efficient to kind of deploy and reasonably pain free. Again, uh, there was a comment last time that there is actually has improved a lot um, in Windows as well, but it was always a bit of a pain point to 
kind of um, in, introduce container level virtualization in, in Windows as opposed to Linux, where you'll see it's just one command away, effectively. So, um, so C groups, yeah, what do they allow as well? Resource management, right? You can flexibly uh, assign um, resources and uh, allocate, for example, uh, quotas, um, you know, this allocation, um, bandwidth, and so on. And you can monitor and account for this, of course, as well per group, which is kind of neat. Um, what's quite interesting, um, how this looks like from a um, container point of view is that you have unique uh, identifiers. So Linux, as you recall, uh, thrives on a set of identifiers. We have process identifiers, we have user identifiers, group identifiers, we have um, inodes, which is uh, information nodes, that's in, um, like file identifiers and everything. So everything has a kind of a primary key somewhere, right, in different dimensions. If you want to think about it in relational sense um, and the um, idea is that even those identifiers are virtualized so within different containers you can have the same identifiers but they point to different things right so it's quite quite interesting so to that level um, as Linux introduced this um, abstraction YRC groups that even PID one doesn't process ID one doesn't mean need to be the same thing across two different um, uh, control groups, even though they're operating on the same operating system, they can even have independent host names. So networking wise, they could be identified differently, uh, different containers, even though running on the same uh, host system, quite, quite, quite neat. So uh, communication is done as usual in, uh, in, in forms of uh, inter-process communication. So either via sockets would be one way or IPC facilities operated offered by the operating system. Generally, you wouldn't want to do this anyway. I mean, if you have, if you have isolated services, they're isolated for, for a reason. If they communicate, network king is generally the way to go. Um, yeah, anyway, so I just want to motivate, you know, how deep it goes and um, that this is not just yet another piece of software we dump on any or install on any operating system, but it's actually ingrained in the fundamental part uh, of, of um, uh, Linux in particular. Um, but we'll see more of this adoption. Uh, Windows, of course, has also a notion of quotas and capacity allocations and so on, but there's different. This is not meant for, uh, generally not meant for the purpose of virtualization, but rather for account-based allocation. So uh, groups of people have you know, certain resources that they can access and use. So it's more like as a user-centric perspective, not so much a um, technical perspective. Okay, so um, now just contrasting containers with VMs on, you know, on, 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 on to, to see this hard and fast in a way, it's really about size. Uh, containers are meant to be super lean. We talk megabytes, we talk about uh, um, VMs, we immediately or more or less or very quickly in any case in the at least 100 megabytes to gigabyte territory. So that's quite a significant difference. Um, and, you know, fast, uh, sorry, small means efficient by any means, right? So if you save it, you want to make, uh, make backups, if you want to create another instance of it. Uh, whatever else, everything will just go um, to be, uh, be be more efficient using this um, mechanism. And then, of course, um, it's easy to integrate with um, tooling. You could do that with operating systems as well. But for example, spinning up an entire Windows instance and then or Linux instance for that matter, and the service therein just takes a lot longer than hopefully spinning up an application, right? So, and I'm not saying that. Uh, containers or Docker specifically are, are the fastest thing on the planet in the first place, uh, but they are significantly faster than spinning up a full operating system. That's the kind of dimensions you want to look at uh, here right now. Um, so there are, of course, also downsides, and we need to be aware of them. So whereas uh, virtual machines really have um, separation up to the operating system level, because it's you know, distinctly different between different instances, um, that's definitely not the case. Um, for, for containers. Um, so the host operating system has considerable influence on um, the security of the un underlying uh, containers and can in principle, you know, inject data, interact and so on. Uh, and you'll notice that because um, one of the key built-in features is that containers, for example, have access again to the file system in addition to other resources, meaning they can also perform certain modifications. There's an isolation concept behind it, but, you know, there's also an opportunity to link them. Um, to, to a certain um, extent. So, yeah, another minor detail is, uh, of course, that um, in, uh, or, or specific to containers, which is kind of not really a, a con per se, it's just a feature, the fact that, you know, data um, can be contained within a container or externally, if it's contained within a container, the data is lost when a container is deleted. That kind of, you know, it's the same for virtual machines as well. If you have something in a virtual computer, you store some information there, delete the virtual machine, guess what? <laughs> the machine, the, the data goes away. But this is 
um, because you will feel that pain point, I'm very sure, at one stage or another. So I'm just bringing it up already here as a very pragmatic uh, um, aspect that's, that's, that's relevant. Whole thing in, in one infographic again. This ties back together the figure that I showed earlier alongside the discussion of the advantage, uh, advantages and disadvantages to some extent, right? Really having a uh, physical server, having an operating system, the Docker engine for, when we talk about Docker in particular, and then the different containers with their libraries and uh, ideally with a significantly reduced um, uh, usage of uh, any sort of resources. Okay, cool. So a lot of motivation, but I think it's important to be clear about the distinctions and the differences that those different, uh, um, um, what, what makes containerization different from any forms of virtualization type one and type two that we talked about, because they live in a bit of a progression uh, there as well. So. As you would expect, and um, we're not getting this territory, I believe, but um, the containerization is, of course, again, a, a starting point for um, an advanced use. So I mentioned that um, the idea about containerization, in contrast to some extent to the traditional virtualization, is that it's only one service run uh, per container. And that, of, of course, invites immediately for thinking, okay, okay, how do we reconstruct my entire infrastructure? Because guess what? It's more than one service. So um, you're quickly in a territory of thinking about how to um, cluster um, containers, right? And how to coordinate their um, execution and so on and scale up and down. So those, though, they have dedicated cluster infrastructure focusing on that purpose alone, being Kubernetes, probably the more popular one, and then an earlier Docker Swarm, which is uh, more tightly or was more tightly associated with Docker itself. So, but anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll look at, to some extent, at uh, how you can develop Docker service, but also how you can compose more complex interactions between them, uh, one aspect at a time. So then we'll return to the discussion a bit. Okay, Docker. Who has heard about Docker? Who has used Docker? I know some, some of my uh, online audience, of course, has. There's definitely no doubt. You, you have, right? So, yes? I mean, uh, the operating system. Ah, good. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned, yeah. Okay. Right. So, but, but, okay, no, 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 no deliverable, let's say, uh, using Docker uh, yet, right? For, unlike, but for you, of course, I assume in your practice. Yeah, basically, it's like, but it's basically also what you want to know, talking about it, Docker is going to be a version that's not delivered. Right. Okay. Good. Good. Um, okay. So, Good. All right. So let's 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 look at some some of the features, I guess. Um, so one of the principles of Docker is that uh, you know containerization is um, yet another concept, to be honest, right? So I mean, uh, for a virtual machine, you follow the intuition that ah, guess what? I know how to install an operating system, I know how to install a service, and so on. So it'd be very easy for me to you know do something virtual box. That's not something where you need significant any sort of uh, programming, yeah, that's a bit but let's say even a scripting background in order to get things going. In Docker, it will be a bit different in the sense that you do indeed, you know, need to, uh, um, um, you know, have considerable console interaction in order to get things, um, or, or at least define a Docker container in the widest um, sense. So it's a bit more of this interaction. But even though that is the case, the one of the objectives of Docker is to make it as simple as possible. So that was one of the key objectives for him. Um, and that is really uh, focusing on the bare essentials um, that it also comes with an ecosystem. So Docker is not just, you know, here's one way of setting up a container, but also how is it, where's, can, is there an efficient way of sharing existing containers, right? So we don't need to rebuild, let's say, if you want to deploy a web server, for example, that we don't need to rebuild this container ourselves, but can we just draw on it? Like a bit like in an app store, right? So like a phone where you basically just uh, pull it with an, or GitHub in a way where you, um, you know, pull the code, recompile it, and deploy it yourself, whatever else. Can we do the same for um, containers? So, and there's this, this ecosystem idea around it as well. Um, and the, uh, some, one, of, one of the aspects is also the, um, the modularity, the systematic, ideally systematic separation of um, processing activities, service processing and storage activities by having a container and then associated a volume. So the volume had, for example, the dedicated storage. Um, role. So that's, that's this model um, as well. Okay. Um, and uh, Docker basically follows the idea of a layered based approach. So the idea you, you, you perform a particular command, 
that results in a um, um, you know image, let's say, and then you can um, perform or in container and you can um, perform a, another command uh, on this container, commit the changes and basically incrementally build up the complexity that you need. Even though there are challenges to this um, concept, as we will see, but uh, I just wanted to uh, highlight those specifics. Okay, so let's let's think about um, Docker. So the um, main aspect in Docker, of course, is that we need to run it somewhere, um, and the, the the practical environment that we can use for this um, can either be our OpenStack. Or, um, you know, the Google Cloud Computing, whatever else. Oh, is that legible? I hope so. Uh, ah, I think we'll do. So, um, so we, we can just uh, basically see what's um, possible um, there. So the, the fundamental idea is to, of course, install a Docker in the first place. I think I cheated and did this already, but I just uh, never. Ah. Yeah, that's already installed, but I'll just uh, signal how the installation would in, 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 in principle be done so that afterwards you would be feeling comfortable, hopefully uh, doing it yourself. I created a new page in our um, course wiki called Docker shorthands. What I put in there is basically a lot of um, commands and um, you know, help um, that can be of practical nature, so, uh, but also very, very incremental help that kind of gets you going in the first place. So for example, the installation of Docker, a uh, very important point, please install it using uh, apt, not snap. So um, you recall that snap is this more modern way of installing things on Ubuntu in particular, and then apt, uh, aptitude um, is the older way of installing things, but this is the more, um, the better integration. I realize some issues with respect to um, features, uh, feature limitations that the snap version had. So in as far as Ubuntu is concerned, please install it the following way. Um, so and that's basically what what I did already before, and so just to signal this one. Um, there's a lot of other different commands that are probably yeah that that will make more sense in a bit. But anyway, so I'll also put um, put in the slide set the instruction of how to in install it um, in the first place. But just to leave you with an impression, the idea was to kind of um, show what this whole business is about. So Docker itself. When you just run it, presents you with a lot of different uh, features, uh, far, far, far too many for, I guess, um, um, our taste to some extent. Um, but you, you need to have it because um, there's simply too much to configure and to, to run. So Docker recognizes a set of different uh, contexts more, more generally. So um, for example, the um, idea that um, Docker can be used as a client for interacting with, um, um, you know, Docker Swarm instance, meaning clusters of uh, Docker containers and so on, um, that it can manage different volumes. Basically, that's, um, you know, um, yeah, volumes of, of, of just managed for data storage that can be flexibly ad, um, attached or removed from particular containers, um, that it can manage additional um, uh, plugins um, or network infrastructure, which is kind of an interesting point as well. Um, but more immediately, uh, so that would be the aspects up here, um, kind of management commands when it comes to configuring the wider infrastructure. But the more immediate commands um, at the bottom here are the ones that are currently more relevant um, to us. And they point to a lot of operational um, activities that you can do on containers. You can start containers, run containers, stop them, uh, restart them, um, destroy them, of course. So if they're running, they don't um, uh, come down, you can kill. Um, um, containers similar to the Linux commands that you are comfortable with. Um, but one concept probably that I briefly need to talk about um, before is um, there's two distinctive notions. Let's see. A classic example is uh, easy to run any. Ah, hang on. But it still doesn't like me. Okay, good. And uh, 
So I just want to motivate some some aspects here. So what I did just now, basically just saying, hey, I want to, for whatever reason, run Nginx. Yeah, I, I don't even quite know why I want to, but Nginx is a web service, right? So, and the idea is, okay, how do we spin up, um, um, you know, um, you know, a web service, of course, is, is, is one point. Um, but that's not the main point I want to, want to make, but rather look at the output for it. And um, after running this, you saw uh, uh, as a first response, basically it said, well, um, uh, unable to find image so-and-so nginx uh, colon latest locally. What it means, basically, um, I instructed it to say, hey, Docker, run this image for me or run this container for me. It's called nginx. And the first thing it does is to see is if there's an image locally stored that you know corresponds to that name and then it would run this particular image of course um note particular the the notation it says nginx dot latest um the um i mentioned before that there is the you know in, in docker similar to uh, development there's the notion of versioning to some extent so you can version certain images so you, you can run you know a web server or nginx version i don't know uh, two or you know two point so and so and so so um, but if not specified otherwise it will always go for the latest one and what it says basically now okay i couldn't find nginx and then it says something like pulling from library nginx and it actually um went um online to the docker, docker registry the central docker registry accessible via docker hub i can just show that bit and basically pulling the image in as far as existing um let's see Motivators. Um, to single basically uh, what's in there. So Docker, I'm thinking about like, like GitHub in a way, but for Docker in a way. Uh, and, um, and you can similarly, um, you can similarly just about really now okay um you know scroll through and see different um uh, versions of engine x but by default it will pull um, the one that is tagged as the official image and here's the the, the the point is that of course uh as with any ecosystem as with github you know there can be multiple versions of the same image that can be slightly customized and so on but what it did was basically pulling this image in the first place but since i said uh, docker run it also executed uh, the image right so here it says um, I concluded my downloading so let's see show my hands a bit it concluded the downloading it has a fixed hash that signals this uh, signifies this image in particular and then it's attempting to run this very image so that's literally what you see at the bottom there is the output um, that is actually produced by the um, execution of um, that particular image uh, and um, what we refer to as a container so we need to separate between two concepts one of the image like the 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 the, the, the blueprint the not non-instantiated version of a particular container and then there is the container which is basically an instance of an image and you can run an arbitrary number of those right so you could run for example two nginx instances based on the same image originally that makes sense Right? So one image, think about class object relationship, we have a class and a, uh, okay, an object instantiation in the context of object oriented programming, it's exactly the same. You can possibly also perform modification on those instances in those containers individually, but they are based off the same image. How do you see this? Well, first of all, uh, what you notice there, hey, why does this stuff never actually return? Um, well, there is a, there is a, uh, a reason to it because we're actually uh, attached to this particular container right now. So we see the output, continuous output of that service. That's of course not something we are terribly, uh, maybe not be terribly interested in right now. So I need to exit out of it uh, as well. So, but I just want to motivate um, one, one other aspect before we get back to this. So how do we this, this, see this differentiation between images and containers? Well, if you run the command docker images, I hope that is legible. The remote ones, I'm not too worried. I'm more worried about my local participants here. Um, at the bottom, right? So it lists all the images that the system currently knows. And it says, well, you know, there is um, the image uh, called engine tag is latest. Again, there could be words, there could be five of those. Um, and there's an idea associated with this when the image was created, or not by me, but rather in the official repository, and its size, right? So, yeah, 133 megawatt. Yeah, we can live with this. I don't I guess but they're smaller ones but anyway there are this is uh, image so and the other command that is uh, uh, useful to know out of, out of the box is a docker ps so ps shows the running docker containers 
I just exited out of the running container, right? So this one is not running anymore, hence you don't get output. However, the, the container is not destroyed, it's just not actively shown. If you run um, docker ps-a, you will still see, uh, you will actually get a container ID. If you look to the palette, again, it's a unique ID for the container. Uh, it in indicates which image it's based off and which command is actually the service entry point. So, uh, you know, which internal command has been run within that particular image. We get back to the image idea. Um, and what the current, so, and what the current status is when it was created. And here it makes reference to the container, the instance, right, that has been created from the image that has been created about uh, uh, then five minutes ago. And uh, ports that are mapped, none. I was too lazy to do that, so I probably should do that again. And the names uh, of um, that container. They come up with those, uh, you know, autogen names because it's a lot faster, basically, to interact using this and to um, um, you know modify containers or delete them. So let's see, Docker RM. I should be able to just say Happy uh, B Johnson. And if I run Docker PS A again, we see there's no image left. So let's run the. Um, Docker, the Nginx one again. So this time I do two things. Uh, no, I do one thing only, which is um, I say dash p um, 80, 80, 80. Any guess what that means? Or oh, should be straightforward. What does that do? Sorry? Kind of, yeah. Um, what well, it does basically it signals a port re redirection because um, the idea is that you could have a service, right? The service we're talking about are generally network service in the first place, right? And they will have certain uh, default ports which they're running on, right? So, which uh, is generally described in documentation to some extent. Sometimes they're fixed, like for example, for MySQL, we know it's 3306, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, IDP three three eight nine. You know all those those kind of things. On for for web services generally port eighty and then uh, four four three if they have um, you know um, um, SSL support in a way. So and the idea is now okay. How do we make because we need to we need to now think about our host here being possibly um, uh, possibly hosting multiple services. How do we avoid conflicts? Right. If you want to for example run Apache web service or two instances of nginx, we need to ensure that there's a redirection to different endpoints basically. On which they are publicly accessible via the VM, right? So the VM now links its port here, the port eighty eighty, to the container's port eighty, right? Uh, so the container exposes its service functionality on port eighty. My host redirects this to uh, my interface port eighty eighty, right? So it's publicly accessible. So the fact that a container has a, uh, a, a serves towards the network does not do anything per se unless it's bound to the host, host's um, uh, network interface, because otherwise it's not accessible outside of the host. Right? This, so the, container the container has an own port is that exposes. That's right. And is it bound to a port in the host? And it's now mapped to a port on the host, yes. Yeah. Or, or is it like if the, one, like the service is running on one port and then has its own port? And it's yeah, so let's do that. Um, hang on. The pens, they're gone. So sad. Uh, is there any pen that I can just. Hmm. Oh, good. Um, yeah. Um, so, no, but, so I need to do it um, mainly for now. But. Um, so the idea is fundamentally, if you think about a container, right? So it's a self-contained service, and this service has some uh, network port that it serves services on. Can also be multiple. Can be, uh, you know, let's say, um, um, yeah, let's stick to port port uh, port eighty. It's a web service. By default, if you run, if you install nginx in your local machine, even if you run it on uh, Ubuntu natively, it will uh, bind itself to port eighty, right? So you just run it, say, sudo apt install uh, nginx, and, and then you open the browser, say localhost uh, port eighty colon eighty. It will expose to the welcome page of, of uh, nginx in the first place so docker being a containerization environment and infrastructure basically is contained within the host right but uh, whatever those containers let's say think about it like a you know a, a, a minified virtual machine they principally have the same infrastructure that 
the entire uh, an entire host would have so they can have you know their own port ranges and uh, facilities that they expose but the challenge is there you can't just um uh, so, so how do you avoid conflicts between uh, competing resource or sorry uh, port allocations on containers right you're running five containers and some of them use port 80 some of them port 443 you know some developer felt clever and wanted to use a mainstream port like 25 I, I don't know, right? So perhaps even violating conventions. But uh, bear in mind that those, uh, those, those, those um, con you know, those um, Docker files from which those images are compiled, if you like, uh, can be written by anyone, right? So they can also be really bad in a sense that people expose uh, ports that they probably shouldn't, uh, um, you know, should be using because they're reserved or privileged ports. And the idea here is that this command dash p redirects. Okay. I know now what port you intended to use within that container, right? So, you know, you wanted to use port 80 for whatever reason, but I don't want to use port 80 in my network environment. I want to redirect the service that you provide on my host, the host that runs the Docker instances to port 8080, right? And I have a second container that also runs Nginx. I redirect you to, let's say, port 8081, or a third one, right? So uh, 8082, so you can separate um, those those redirections, even though internally within those containers, they are actually always listening on port 80, please. So you, so you cannot turn that command to the same endpoint. That's right. It will ind indicate it will be conflict, and it will indicate the conflict on the host side. It will say, hey, hey hang on, not again. So 80, 80 is already taken. Uh, I can't do that, um, um, can't do that allocation. Uh, but internally, of course, different containers can use the same internal port. But just in the host, we have you know a, a unique set of ports that we can allocate, so we can't repeat this uh, arbitrarily. Yeah, that's right. And um, okay, so now I um, run this command again, just very very much the same uh, as um, before. And um, so now I just need to um, figure out the uh, external IP again of my instance because um, this is running on OpenStack now so you need to have some sort of basic infrastructure that you of course um, installing the docker environment on so and that happens in my case your open stack can be anywhere really if anyone wants you to, wants you to wants to try it on the um on your own windows environment or whatever else just go for it and have a see how it works it would be interesting to learn uh, that of course it, in, in in terms of um, the actual deployment you would want to do it um of course in some sort of hosted environment so this is the um ip that is the, the, ah, the floating ip attached to my particular instance. Ah, didn't pick up on it. I don't like you. So. So this would now redirect. So what I'm did, what I did now, I'm accessing port 8080 on my um, uh, you know um, vm instance right so which sits in, in open stack which internally redirects to this one and we'll see that here because i was still bound to the lock output here you see there's a get request uh, that has just come in from you know uh, from a particular agent which um, um uh, with you know on on um, or 88 but it anyways it has received this particular request i just to demonstrate this uh, again and make it more explicit let me just um minify the execution here and so show you again in the background what happens so when i uh, basically and i so i'm you see that there's the invocation happening right so you clearly see it's redirected to this particular docker container uh, but externally accessible to on um port 8080 so I exit out of it again um so one of the challenges so is that will of course um want to run this independently and persistently right so it's not fun that I need to apparently consumably need to tie my uh, 
uh, console in order to run it uh, sensibly. So you can just basically um, say docker run dash d for detached, and then using the, the hang on, it should resolve. See if I got it wrong. Let's see. Um, ah, right, right, right. So ordering of uh, I did it wrong again. Uh, yeah, that wouldn't work, of course. I would create another image, but I'm just wondering why 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 I get my commands that wrong. Hang on. Um, Detach on a different domain background. Okay. Um, anyway, so um, it should start it. So, the course, and we don't even need to indicate this in the first place. So, okay, good. Yes. So now it should be running independently. What I wanted to uh, the demonstrate there was. Um, uh, when you run dash d in docker run, it basically starts, oh sorry, creates a new instance uh, of um, um, of the container, but detaches it, so it runs in background. Uh, in docker start now, um, you, do, you don't need to do that explicitly, that's the opposite. In fact, it starts in the background, but if you want to link it, you would need to indicate that you want to attach it and see the console. So by default, of course, containers should run independently um, as well. And the docker... Um, um, the Docker um, daemon is actually quite nice in the sense that it also ensures that uh, the last state of a running container is um, 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 you know, re-established after you restart the host. So if you're running, for example, updates on your host, right, so and uh, you need to restart the system for whatever reason, how rare that may be in Linux, it will also ensure that the services will start up afterwards. So it's quite neat and nice. So, okay, I run Docker PS again after, um, you know, starting it again. And uh, what you see here is basically um, the same information, but it also shows here the uh, port mapping quite explicitly. So it says, you know, on all interfaces on the host, the VM now being the host, uh, on port 8080 is redirected to port 80 uh, uh, in the instance. That's the, that's the uh, convention how it works. So specification is always host first and then container second, right? So it's important. That will be something you probably need to look up again when the time comes, but it's always host first and then container second. And then there's whatever name uh, it has been, you know, um, auto generated for this particular instance. Anyway, we didn't get terribly far, but anyway, um, you would want to get a sense that there's a notion of images and there's a, a notion of containers, which is kind of an instance of the images. Those are two distinctive things. We can build new containers of the same image, of course, but um, yeah, so that's the idea we'll continue there of course uh in uh, in the next uh, session in the meantime however i just want to point you again to the docker shorthands uh, just to get a sense of the kind of functionality that's there some of the commands that we just talked about is something you'll find there back again docker images docker ps docker ps a dash a um the port mapping um in as far as i introduced it to some extent uh, and then a lot of stuff that we haven't talked about, like how to properly stop containers uh, and some convenience functionality. There's also uh, the link that sort of direct to the Docker reference. Uh, this is, of course, the go to reference for all the commands. But sometimes, oh, that doesn't resolve nicely. That's weird. Um, I'll fix that. So, um, to kind of you know look up um, the comprehensive set of um, commands, but that probably will be a bit excessive in many instances. But the Docker hands, shorthand should be a good starting point to get a comfortable, uh, get you guys comfortable with um, basic Docker 
functionality. Next time we talk a bit more how to create Docker um, containers and specifically and uh, what to do and what not to do and how we can bring it back to Go in particular, right, to our Go services. Okay, sorry, I kept you, oh yeah, yes, too long, sorry for that. No one reminded me. I should remind myself, sorry for that. Um, in any case, um, so thank you very much for your attention. I think we have um, another class immediately following here in the process.